So if you'll take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 4, uh, we're going to start in verse 27. We're kind of starting at the end of last week. We're in the third week of a series called Prayers for Exodus, uh, where we are walking through the Exodus story, and each week uh, we have a prayer prompt that reminds us of something about God's character, and also reminds us of a way to pray. And so uh, a repeated thought throughout this series has been um, that what you know of someone affects what you will ask of them. Okay, that's true in academics, it's true in athletics, it's true in prayer. What you know of someone affects what you will ask of them. And and so we want to know God rightly. We want to know God as he is so that we will pray more fervently. And so each week we have this prayer prompt. Uh, We've handed out cards the last couple of weeks. If you have not received those, we have those at the info desk. We'd love for you to take those and use those. First week, we were reminded that we can trust God's heart. Because God's always at work, even in dark times, he's always at work for our good and his glory so we can trust God's heart. Second, we, uh, last week we looked at we can hope in God's power because it's not about us. It's not about us. Moses had to learn that last week. He's going to keep learning that throughout the book of Exodus. But Moses had to learn that we'd hope in God's power because it's not about us. Us. Now, today we move on to our next prayer focus, that we would know God's name. And the reason we want to know God's name is because life is hard and we have no other hope. We need to know God's name because life is hard and we have no other hope. Now, you might be thinking, well, that feels like an easy prayer to answer. Like, I'm not going to forget God's name. Well, uh, in the Bible, a name is not simply an identity or an identification or a, a call sign. A name, name it refers to character. Name refers not just to what we call God, but what God is like. It points us to who he is. And the reality is that when life gets hard, sometimes we forget who God is. We don't forget his name, but we do sometimes forget his character. We forget what he's like. And when life gets hard, it's really crucial that we remember what he's like. Life's about to get hard for Moses as we look at this story today. Let's get caught up in it. So God has heard the uh, prayers of his people. He's at work to deliver them. God's called Moses to do that. And now Moses has set out in obedience. And in chapter 4, verse 27, he goes and he meets with his brother Aaron. They see each other. uh, And Moses tells Aaron all that has happened. He tells them what God has said. He tells them the signs God has done. Pick it up in verse 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people Believe. Now, Aaron basically serves as a character reference for Moses. He goes to the people, tells them what God has said, does the signs that God has given, and the people, it says in verse 31, the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. So they, they hear that God has heard, and they're, they're excited about this. They bow their head and worship. Now, Before we move on, I want you to think about the last time someone told you good news that also had hard news in it, uh, something you wanted to hear that had something you didn't want to hear in it, and I want you to think back to how that went. Like, hey kids, we're going to get ice cream after you clean your room, right? Kids are in the car by the time you say after you clean your room, right? Right? Or a friend of mine was on the Price is Right and won the wheel, like she, she killed it on the spinny wheel thing. And then she also won the Showcase Showdown, which is good news until you understand and realize that you have to pay taxes on all that before you can leave with any of it, right? So we hear, we hear the good and great news and sometimes we miss the hard. And I wonder if something like that is going on with the people. If, if the people have heard, God's going to deliver us. Because remember what God told Moses is, you're going to go to the people, I'm going to deliver you, but Pharaoh's not going to let you go unless I stretch out my hand on him. And so they hear the good, and they miss the hard, and then when things start going bad, they forget. They forget God's name. They forget God's character. And so what we're going to see today 
what we're going to see today is um, God's going to be reminding Moses, God's going to be reminding the people, God's going to be reminding them of, uh, of his good name. And we need to know God's name because life's hard and we have no other hope. And so God, Moses and Aaron go to the people. They tell them what's going to happen. Verse 31 says they believe, they worship. You can almost hear the celebration rumbling through the people. Think about Moses being Moses in that moment. You can almost hear Moses thinking, man, this might actually work, right? And then Moses uh, goes to Pharaoh in verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Do you hear the confidence in that? Do you hear the, the, the authority and the excitement in that? Well, Pharaoh is not phased in verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. So Pharaoh is not phased. Pharaoh's like, look, I don't know who that God is, and I'm not going to bow to him. I'm not doing what he says. Well, Moses responds in verse 3. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice the Lord our God. Do you hear, do you hear the difference in verse 1 and verse 3? Thus says the Lord in verse 1. Verse 3, please, like please let us, let us go. He goes from confidence to, to fear in, in just a couple of verses. Well, again, Pharaoh is unfazed. Look at verse uh, 4. It says, But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. And the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So not only does Pharaoh not let the people go, Pharaoh makes their job harder. So their, their life that was already hard gets even more difficult in verses 6 to 14. And what we're seeing here is Pharaoh in seed form, we're going to see next week in, chapter, in, the, in the plagues, Pharaoh is saying to God, you're not going to tell me what to do. This is my kingdom. This is my land. These are my people. And, and you kind of stay out of it. He's, saying, he's setting himself up as an enemy of God. He's rebelling against this God. And as I was reading that this week, I was just struck by how often we do that too. Where we hear God's word and our response is, God, I really don't want you in my business. I really don't want you to speak into my life. Because this is my life. This is my world. This is my space. God, you, you kind of stay out. The Bible calls that sin and rebellion. That's what Pharaoh's doing, and it's so often what we do. And so the people are being treated harshly, and then the, the leaders of the workforce go to Pharaoh and, and ask what's going on. Look at verse 15. It says, Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault's in your own people. Now, I want us to see, before we look at what Pharaoh says, I want us to see how the people are defining themselves. They're calling themselves Pharaoh's servants. They're not, they're not Pharaoh's servants. They're God's people. But they're, they're defining themselves in relation to Pharaoh, not in relation to God. Verse 17. But Pharaoh said, you are idle, you are idle. That's why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. And so the, the foreman and the taskmasters go to Pharaoh and they, they want grace. They don't get any of it. Pharaoh doesn't give them grace. And they realize they're in trouble in verse 19. And then it says in verse 20 that they go and met Moses and Aaron. And you, you can almost see Moses and Aaron waiting for him. Hey, how'd it go? In verse 20. It says they met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them. And they came out from Pharaoh and said, the Lord, look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. In other words, Moses, this is all your fault. This is your fault. All this talk about deliverance, all this talk about letting us go to worship this God, this is your fault, Moses. And so what we've seen is in just about a chapter, the people have gone from bowing their heads and worshiping to you made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh. You did this to us. So that's what's happened to the people. What's happened to Moses? 
Because it's one thing for the people to kind of lose faith. What, what happens if Moses, how's Moses going to respond to this challenge? Because he, he's gone from the next big thing to being the thing that's hated by those he came to help. So how's Moses going to respond? Look at verse 22. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you've not delivered your people at all. How's Moses going to respond? Well, Moses forgets three things. I want you to see them in those two verses. He forgets three things. First thing he forgets is God's name. Look at verse 22. It says, Then Moses turned to the Lord. That should be all caps in your English Bible. That's the name Yahweh. And said, O oh Lord, that next one is not all caps. So the name he calls God is not the name that God gave him. He forgets God's name. Then he forgets God's character. He says, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? Not only does he forget God's name, he forgets what God is like. He, he, he ascribes evil to God. He also blames God for what Pharaoh is doing. So Moses forgets God's name, he forgets God's character, and he forgets God's promise in verse 23. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people, and you've not delivered your people at all. Well, well Moses, God told you what was going to happen. He told you, you're going to go to Pharaoh. He's not going to let you go unless I extend a strong hand on him, and then he will let you go. God told Moses this was going to happen. So Moses, in a chapter, has forgotten the name of God, the character of God, and the promise of God. He's forgotten. He's forgotten all that. He remembered the good, and he forgot the hard. And again, I think this happens with us all the time. I think this happens with us all the time. We, we, hear, we hear good and hard news, and we remember good and forget hard. Let me, let me show you a way we do it with the words of Jesus. It's John 16, 33. It's going to be on the screen. Jesus says this, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. That sounds good, right? Who doesn't want peace? In me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. That sounds good too, right? Jesus has overcome the world. Look at what's in the middle. In this world you will have tribulation. But what can happen is we can hear the two good things and just skip right over the hard thing. But the reality is we live in a broken world and we are going to have tribulation. And yet we can remember the good and we can forget the hard. And I wonder if that's what's happened to the people here in Exodus 5 and 6. Now, when, when we do that, when we remember the good and forget the hard, it, it ends up creating a false narrative about Christianity that we buy into. Mainly that there's a Christianity without problems. That, we, that if we just trust Christ, if we just follow Jesus, if we just walk with him, then we won't have any problems. Now, the problem with this is the Bible. Okay? The Bible teaches the opposite of that. It teaches, in the world you'll have tribulation. But we can believe this narrative that if I just follow Jesus and I check all the right boxes and do all the right things, then my life's going to be easy. And that is nowhere in the Bible. Um, when I was a college pastor at a church in Mississippi, one of our uh, leaders in the college ministry had a son um, and several years ago, they had found out that his son was, had diabetes. Now, my friend went to his pastor at the time and, and was just asking for prayer. Just, uh, you know, it was all new. They didn't, know, they didn't know much. They just had that one piece of information. And he asked his former pastor to pray. And the pastor looked at him and said, listen, if you had enough faith, your son would not have diabetes. Now that, yeah, I mean, it doesn't take... It doesn't even take a Christian to know that's not wise to say, right? Like that. It's just, and, and, and also, it's like not consistent with the Bible. But when we hear the good and forget the hard, we can create these ideas that if I just walk with Jesus and do all the right things and check all the right boxes, that my life's going to be easy and not have problems. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Well, Moses has forgotten all of that. Moses has forgotten God's name, he's forgotten God's character, he's forgotten God's promise. And so God reminds him of what's true in chapter 6, verse 1. All so that we can know God's name because life's hard. And we have no other hope. We have no other hope. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. 
says, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. God says to Moses, I want you to watch. I want you to watch and see. And then God reminds Moses first of his name. Look at verse 2. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, all caps. That's Yahweh. That's his covenant name. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by the name Lord, I did not make myself known to them. In other words, hey Moses, I gave you a name. Use it. I gave you a name to know me by. I'm Yahweh, the God who keeps his promises. I want you to know that, Moses. He says, I didn't didn't give that name to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I gave it to you. So God wants him to remember his name. Then God reminds him of his character in verse 4. He says, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they have lived as sojourners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I've remembered my covenant. In other words, Moses, my character, my character is that I care for my people. My character is that I have heard their prayer. I care for them. Moses. God reminds him of his name. God reminds him of his character. And then God reminds him of his promise in verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will... um, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. You shall know that I'm the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So God is saying that to Moses to remind Moses of his promise. And then Moses is to say that to the people. Moses forgot God's name, his character, and promise. God reminds Moses of his name, his character, and his promise. And then Moses goes to tell the people in verse 9. And this is perhaps the saddest verse to me in these two chapters. It says, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. In other words, he went and told them what God had said. But they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. No, Moses goes and tells the people, no, God has said, this is, thus saith the Lord, this is God's word. And it says the people did not listen because of their broken spirit. That's, that's about what's going on inside of them. You know, sometimes life and, and pain can do something to our heart where our soul gets so broken that it's really hard to hear the truth of God's word. Now, now listen, God is not bound. God can, God can break through that. God can speak and do whatever God does, but there's something on this side of that in our own soul where it's hard for us to hear because of what's going on in here. And maybe some of you know what that feels like. I do. And then there's harsh slavery. There's stuff going on around us. There's stuff going on inside us, but there's stuff that starts going on around us where life just gets really, really painful. And so it's hard to hear God's word. It's hard to hear what God has to say because of what's going on inside and because of what's going on outside. It says the people did not listen because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. And I wonder... I wonder if that's going on for some of you today. If because of what's going on in your heart and in your life, if sometimes it's hard to hear from God. It's hard to hear good news because of what's going on in you and around you. That's what's going on with the people. They did not listen because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery, and if that's you, I want you to hold on for a moment because there's hope. There really is hope. So, again, um, God, God tells Moses to go and talk to the people. Moses goes and talks to the people. The people don't listen. Verse 10, so the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of this land. Now, we know that the people did not listen to God. Verse 12, Moses doesn't. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. 
How's Pharaoh going to listen to me? The people didn't listen. How's Pharaoh going to listen? So do you see kind of where Moses is now? Verse 13. It says, But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now, we don't know exactly what God said there. We don't know how God said it. But what we do know is that chapter 7, Moses goes and tells Pharaoh to let the people go. And we'll pick that up next week. But today, in chapters 5 and 6, we see that Moses forgets God's name, character, and promise. And God reminds Moses of his name, character, and promise. Because we need to know God's name. We need to know his name. Because life is hard, and we have no other hope. Okay, And so that's our two application points too today. We've got to know God's name because life is hard. <laughs> life is hard. Life is hard. If someone tells you life is not hard, they're selling something. Okay? Like, life is hard. We live in a broken world. One person said everyone is either in the middle of something hard, coming out of something hard, or about to go into something hard. We get these small reprieves from hard before we go back into it. Like, we live in a broken world, and it's hard. It's hard. And because life is hard, we need to know that we have hope. But so often when things get hard, we forget what we so desperately need to remember. It happened to Moses. It happened to God's people. It happens to us. We forget. We forget how good God is. We forget God's name. We forget God's character. We forget God's promise. Because life's hard. And that that hard stuff we're walking through can get inside us. And, and all the hard going on around us can, can make us put up a wall to God and his word. We don't want to listen. But it's in those moments that we need to remember what we have so easily forgotten. We need to know God's name because life is hard. One of the privileges of being a pastor is getting to walk with people through really difficult things. And it's been uh, one of the privileges of my life to get to walk with some of our people through really, really difficult things and to see them hold on to God's name and character and promise. And it's just been a privilege to watch that. Um, I want to be careful and I want to be honoring. Uh, I spent a lot of time with John Griffin toward the end of last year with the goal of caring for him and praying for him and encouraging him. And every time I would sit down with him, he would, he would just look at me with his look that he had, you know. I raised like the, kind of this thing he did. And he would say, you know, you know, Brian, God's been so good to me. God's been so good to me. And I came there hoping to encourage him, and I left thinking I got saved again. You know, like, I mean, just, just leaving just real encouraged. In the Lord, because this man remembered God's character as he was facing the impending end of his days. He knew God's name. And even when life was hard, even when life was hard, he remembered the goodness of his God. Now, all of us are not going to have that story, but all of us are going to have hard. And we've got to remember God's name. We've got to know it because life's hard. Second reason we need to know God's name is because we've got no other hope. We've got no other hope in the midst of hard. Now, the problem, is not, <laughs> the problem is not the hard. The problem is how we respond to it. So often when we face something that's hard, uh, what we try to do is control it. And we're, we almost become little pharaohs saying to God, I got this. Stay out. Stay away. Stay out of my life. I got this. This is me and mine. And, and our control, like Pharaoh's, is an illusion. It's not real. But we try, we try to control because life's hard. Another thing we try to do, some of us, is we try to escape. We think if we can just drink enough, eat enough, watch enough, do enough, buy enough, sell enough, if, if we can just do all that, we can escape the hard. And the problem is we, we can't do anything long enough, hard enough, to get out of hard. 
Some of us, we don't, we don't try to control, we don't try to escape. For some of us, we just try to exert power and fix. We're, we're just going to get our little tool belt on and we're going to fix this problem and it's going to go away. Now, none of those things get us out of heart. None of them do. They actually end us with two problems. The first problem is they either get us into a place of despair or pride. Despair because we realize it didn't work. Pride because it did for a time. So, but it doesn't fix hard. The second problem with trying to control, escape, or fix our problems, the second problem with that is that our doing that is a way of our trusting ourselves or something other than God. And what the Bible calls that is idolatry. The Bible calls it rebellion. The Bible calls it sin. So all these ways we're responding to the hardness around us and the hardness in us, all those, all those ways are actually making things worse and piling up sin. And one day the Bible tells us that we're going to stand before the God that we said, stay out of my life. And we're going to owe him a debt because of our sin. And we're going to deserve all of his wrath because of our sin. And in that moment, our hope will not be our control. Our hope will not be our escape. Our hope will not be our ability to fix. We'll have one hope. One hope. And we need to know his name. Acts 4.12 says this, there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We need to know Jesus' name. We need to know the name of Jesus because the God we've rebelled against, the God we said, get out of my life, that God loved us so much. Isn't that crazy? Isn't it crazy that God would love us? He loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to live a perfect life, die on a cross in our place, and then rise victorious over sin in the grave so that all of us rebellious people And so we need to know God's name. We need to know the name of Jesus because there's no other name by which we must be saved. And so I want you to be saved today. Some of you are thinking, I'll get to that. Like, I'll, I'll get to that one day. That's not important to me right now. I'm not really feeling it right now. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus died in your place to pay for your sin. Trust him today. Man, don't, don't leave here without placing your faith and hope in Jesus. The one name by which we must be saved. We got to know God's name. We got to know God's name because life's hard. And that's the only name that's going to see us through a difficult day. We need to know the name of Jesus. We need to know the name of Jesus. Because that's the only name that gives us hope to stand before a holy God. And so we need to know God's name. Because we've got no other hope. And life is incredibly hard. And so we need to know him. My hope is that we would know him together. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for your kindness to us. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, I pray, I pray that we would be a people who remember your name, your character, and your promise. And that when we face really difficult times, when we face really difficult days, that we would, we'd be a people that trust you, that trust you with our lives. So Lord, would you make that so? Father, if there's anyone listening to this who has not yet trusted you, who trusted Christ, as the Lord and Savior, would you, would, you, uh, would you grab their hearts today and not let go? Would you, would you reach into their hearts, give them a new heart, give them faith to trust you, give them a longing for your goodness and your grace? Oh, God, would you save people today? Lord, would you do that for your glory alone, for your glory alone? Would you do that? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.